We're about two business days away from the first ever Cyber Exchange Live Online Summit being broadcast from the beautiful St. Francis Center here in the town of Ajax. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the lands of the people of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. This land is protected under the Williams Treaties. Today, before I begin, I want to thank the town of Ajax, Mayor Sean Collier and his team, the team at CyberX, for making this fascinating studio happen amidst the pandemic. The topic today is one that you have probably heard about in multiple variations, but it holds particular importance in the new normal that we're in. Many of you would have heard of the name Gabriel Garcia, the author of the book, 100 Days of Solitude. In that book, using the Latin American style of magical realism, he talks about the idea that uh, as human beings, we have three types of lives. Number one, a public life. Number two, a private life. And number three, a secret life. You see, what Garcia was trying to point out in his vein of magical realism was this idea that we're able to control what people can see of us and what they cannot. But fast forward to today, when you look at the worlds of the online and the offline and how the lines are blurred, perhaps not even non-existent to a certain degree, what is private or what is public and what is secret can no longer be clearly seen or clearly understood. You know, Edward Snowden said something to the effect of, I would rather live without a state than without a voice. And what he meant by that was, is that once you erode those lines of privacy, you and I are left without a voice. If you recall two weeks ago while talking to Bill Harmer, I quoted the existentialist philosopher when I said, I think, therefore I am. And today, as we discuss privacy and issues around privacy, I'll quote another existentialist philosopher and say, hell is other people. Today I'm joined by someone who is a mentor to me, someone who's been on the Cyber Exchange Advisory since uh, its very inception, and someone who's guided a lot of activities in Canada and across North America around issues around privacy, security, and confidentiality. My guest today goes by the name of Binary Tattoo, and all of you know her as Kat Kood. So please join me in welcoming Kat. Kat, welcome to the Power Hour. Thank you very much. Binary Tattoo. Binary, I guess, refers to the digital aspect of our existence. Tattoo, yep. reflecting on or perhaps suggesting something permanent. But the key there is choice. You put that tattoo there by choice. Is it true that in this, this focus that you have on privacy stems from the fact that our choice and our voice is basically being eroded? Oh, that's a great way of putting it. Um, yeah, essentially, uh, some things are by choice. Uh, when we curate things online, like if you put a picture on Instagram, that is very much akin to going to the tattoo parlor and deciding what you want to put on your body. But in a lot of what we're doing online right now, which you alluded to beautifully as this private life or even secret life, is I need to search something up online. That's not a curated thing I want to share with the public, but it's information I'm looking for but it is also being added to my binary tattoo or my digital identity. And I want everyone to sort of digest this metaphor of this idea of the world of the digital ecosystem as this tattoo parlor of sorts, where you go in and you've asked for something, but then you get bombarded with other things and you're not quite sure what you come out with. Let's just stay in that framework for a bit and go into Kat's perspective. Kat, what was that moment when you realized that issues around privacy and speaking to them truth to power per se, was your calling. I know that you have a background in both mechanical engineering and software engineering and spent quite a lot of time uh, at BlackBerry, but there must have been a moment when you said, privacy, that's where I find myself and I find a room of my own. Kat? I, I think the privacy moment came from parenting. Um, the security came from BlackBerry for sure because yeah. I knew what we had put into our product in order to make it um, structurally sound to protect individuals. And um, BBM was the first encrypted way to instant message. Like we had all this stuff in there. And then when Apple came out with the iPhone, 
and we used to say it was sexier because it was, it was a sexier product. It still is, <laughs> but um, it, uh, it didn't protect people's information. And that was, I think, really eye-opening for us because we knew how much time and energy we had spent on creating this secure world and people didn't care. Right. They, they saw something that was more fun or that had uh, the original iPhone had that beer pouring app. I don't know if everyone remembers that. Like that was <laughs> what do. people wanted. And we were all sitting there going, you're seriously trading security for beer pouring? But that's what people wanted. And if anyone missed that, it was literally a device that you turned it on its side and it looked like the beer was pouring. It was, it was not fancy. Um, <laughs> but I think it was as a parent where I realized that I really wanted to protect my children. Um, and I, I didn't realize this, of course, until after I had posted the birth announcements and all the other information, which I have since gone and scraped from the internet, uh, about how much we, I, we are creating an identity for people who don't have a choice in creating the identity. And so that was kind of the privacy moment where I sort of said, how many other people have, like you said, this choice? How many other people are tattooing me without me knowing? Right. And, um, and where can I take back ownership of that choice? Let's just unpack that a little bit more. Now, you brought this important concept around the difference between security and privacy. Can you delineate a little bit further on that and explain to our viewers where does the line get drawn between you could be secure but not necessarily private? Kat? Yeah, so that's, that's always a tough one because I think it comes also back to a little bit of your public-private thing or even private um, secret is security is, is often thought of more in the physical. It's it's the access, right? And can you get access or not is the security. Where privacy is, once you have private data, you can't unknow that, right? right. So, so um, security would be, can you get into my home? Sure. Uh, and then I'm protecting you from getting into my house. Where privacy is, if you opened it, what did you see there? And I can't get that back. And so that's often why, to me, privacy is so much more important than security because it, there's always a chance that security is breached, that you can get into something, but you can't do any damage. But once that privacy is breached, the damage is always done. That damage is nestled in the heart of data. I think uh, you and I have had numerous conversations in our work that we've done uh, at Durham College, for example. We've spoken repeatedly about uh, data, data as the new oil, and data being something that holds a lot of key pieces of information about an individual that can be used uh, against them. Now, I'm sure our viewers are quite aware of the fact that uh, at any point of time, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kat, Facebook, as an example, not to pick on them uh, specifically, holds close to, what, 52,000 data points about an individual. What do we mean by they've got 52,000 data points about an individual at any given time? So a lot of the data that's being collected right now is um, inference data or data <laughs> that is assumed off of other things. Uh, so there's data you input. So there's the photos you put in, there's all of that kind of stuff. There's the, the statuses you put into to things, that's easy. Um, but then there's the connections you have. And so based on your connections, what inferences are there? Like if all of your connections are pro a certain political party, then the assumption is you are probably also pro that political party because right. that's who your assumption or your connections follow. So the, you can in Europe request a file from Facebook and say, give me everything you have on me, which is what Max Schrems did. And if, if people are unfamiliar with Max Schrems, he started, um, he's a lawyer in, uh, in the EU and I've seen him speak and he is so passionate about individuals reclaiming privacy. And so um, he's, he's been a lot of the driving force behind the EU taking ownership again of individual privacy. But when he requested his file from Facebook, it was a tiny little sliver of stuff he put in. And then it was all sorts of other information. So when we talk about other people owning our digital identity as well, I could decide never to add my phone number to any online service, but right. you have my phone number. So if you go into an online service and it says, hey, can we help you connect with other people? You could say, sure. And now that service has my name, my email address, my phone number, and let's say my birthday from you. Right. Then another person does the same, right? So that's where Facebook is collecting, as an example, all of this data out of the contact books of everyone you're connected with. And there's nothing we can even do about that. So one of the issues we had with Facebook uh, that they had found was that they were actually maintaining whole profiles on people who had never actually signed up for Facebook because they had collected enough information out of other people's books and contact books and everything else in order to make those profiles. You know, there's the saying where it says, you know, I never asked to be alone. 
I just ask to be let alone, which is a fundamental difference in that you can be your own person without anybody interfering in that. Can you talk to us a little bit more about once you do sign up for an online application, Facebook, Twitter, whatever else have you, there's the terms and conditions that are nestled within it. Is that terms and conditions, and perhaps you're delving into the world of privacy by design a little bit, and we'll come to that very shortly, but is that terms and conditions all that it is to privacy, or is privacy much more than that? No, so this is actually a big pet peeve of mine, yep. is that terms and conditions are supposed to be a statement of what a company is actually doing. Uh, like a license is a statement that you passed a test. So I will often see, uh, especially in entrepreneurial groups, people are like, hey, does anyone have a GDPR uh, privacy policy? And someone will go, oh, just copy it off another site. Like you can't copy it off another site because that is a statement of what you're doing as a company. So if you are not supporting everything that's inside that terms of service, you can't claim that you are from right. the company side. From um, an individual side, I have read those terms of service. They they take a long time. I think it, they, someone said it's 180 hours a year if you were to read all the terms of service for all the services that you're on. And that's for an average individual, not someone in tech who probably has a heck of a lot more than that. Right. So um, the onus on us to actually read that and understand it is too much. Yeah. Uh, and so what have we actually signed on for? What have we actually given away? And that's why a lot of these privacy regulations have flipped it and said, we can't put the onus on the user. The onus has to be on the company. The right. company has to put the individual first, and this is a statement about how you've done that, instead of the other way around. So let's go into the world of compliance, rules and regulations. Privacy, in terms of sharing of data, doesn't just impact how you share data, but also impacts the data that you collect, and also requires a certain level of consent. Can you help us understand, before we delve more into compliance and the rules and regulations that are out there, what do we mean by consent? So in order to collect data from someone, especially personal data, especially sensitive data, uh, you have to have permission from that individual in order to collect the data. So it used to be an opt out, and now we're saying you need to opt in. It used to be, look, I'm going to collect all this data from you, and if you don't like it, take time, go into the privacy policies, go change it. Right. Uh, but now we flipped that model to say, look, I, you want my service, and the trade-off for that service is I'm going to collect this data from you. Right. Uh, a great example is something like Netflix, which is something we do pay for. Right. But in order to provide a view into their catalog that's, that's targeted at us, they need to collect the data of all the movies that we've watched and Correct. if we've liked them or haven't liked them. Right. So that's an example of when you sign up for their terms and service, it says, hey, by the way, we're collecting this data. And if you don't like it, then essentially that's not a service for you. Right. And I think this this uh, this dichotomy of opt in versus opt out really brings up this conversation around the value exchange. You know, I often repeat this in wherever I've given a, uh, given a talk or whenever I've been in closed settings is that if it says uh, free on the label, it's probably a price uh, beyond what you're able. And uh, the reason for that is quite simply nothing comes for free. And can you talk to us a little bit about what is this value exchange dichotomy that happens? Often people assume, yep, I'm on Twitter, you know, it's no cost to me. Well, if I go into the nitty gritty, there is a cost for my connectivity, there is a cost for my device, but it technically looks as if it's free. When we talk about value exchange, how does an organization like a social media behemoth look at the value that they can attain from someone? So uh, that's a good one. So there's a lot of different things. I mean, some things have more value. Pregnancy and babies are worth more. Weddings are worth more. Like there are certain target audiences where everything is kind of worth a little bit more because that, that target audience is spending more money. Um, but we always use the expression that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Yep. And uh, essentially it's a trade-off. So the example I like to use is I have a point system with my grocery store. And um, that grocery store, I have, I have made back thousands of dollars in points because I, I use the system, but they know every grocery item I've ever purchased. So let's say I use that, that grocery store, but I only bought junk food from the grocery store and I bought all my healthy food from farmer's markets. Sure. And then one day the company I'm working for decides to use um, that insurance company that owns the grocery store in order to provide health insurance. They could use data to say, look, you know what, this woman cat, she is only buying junk food. So we're going to mark her health insurance at a different premium because she clearly isn't a healthy eater. Right. That's not a full picture of who I am, 
but that is a way that my data could be used and abused, right? It's the same thing with a Fitbit. If you wear your Fitbit and then you take it off for a while, were you injured? Did you just not remember to put it on? Did you have a rash on your wrist and you, wrist and you didn't want to wear it? That, the underlying data behind why you weren't being measured isn't there, but someone could make assumptions based on the rest of the data. And so to me, there's always a risk in that assumption. Like what algorithm is gonna look at my data and make an assumption about me based on some other information? Yep. I think it's very important for our users just to get uh, those of you who may not necessarily have uh, an eye into how artificial intelligence operates. I think what Kat is talking about when she's referring to algorithms is that there are algorithms out there that are looking for trends. For example, in Facebook, there are three fundamental algorithms that plore deeply into what you're posting, for example, or into your pictures to see who else they can tag into it. The whole premise of all of these algorithms is to make associations, but as Kat also said, these, a lot of these associations are based on assumptions that have biases laid in within them. Kat, explore this world a little bit more for us. I know I mentioned I want to go into some compliance and sort of peel through the layers of some of this. Uh, there are no secrets on the internet, and I stand firm uh, by that. I'm sure we can go back and forth on that discussion. But can you talk to our audience a little bit more about, so if Facebook has a data set and Starbucks has a data set, why would they share it with one another? And who else would be interested in that data set? I think about two weeks ago when I was talking to, uh, I think it was Bill Harmer, if I'm not mistaken, I mentioned something where it was a bit of a metaphorical statement, but I said, look, Starbucks is more of a technology company than it is a coffee uh, producer or a coffee sort of uh, making company. Um, there's, there's this need to share data between companies. Can you give us some examples of where this happens and why you're going to see this happening more and more and more? So really, it's a marketing ploy. All of it's a marketing ploy. So, I mean, I don't have infants, so I don't want ads for diapers. Right. Um, but someone out there knows I love hoodies because I get so many ads for hoodies. And I finally got sucked into one company I kept seeing and bought the hoodie. Uh, so it does work, right? So there is that element of, I'd rather see ads for the things I'm actually looking for anyway than, than otherwise. And those marketing dollars, the companies would much rather target their marketing dollars into customers that are more likely to buy. Totally makes sense. Um, but because of the quantity of information that they have, there's all sorts of cases where like Facebook will have an ad and they'll show that ad to a hundred people in the area. Right. And then you have your email address and then you go into that store with that ad. Like, let's say it was a Lululemon ad and it said, I don't know, pants are 30% off. And you go into Lululemon and then they say, can I have your email address? Well, right. you give them your email address. And now they've correlated the data that Facebook says, we've shown it to people. And then Lululemon comes back and says, okay, here are the 50 people that bought pants in the last week. And Facebook says, yeah, out of those 50 people, 30 of them were people I showed ads to. And so they're like, great, this is, a, this is working. So I'm going to continue to give you money, Facebook. Facebook, you're going to continue to do this. But now Facebook has the knowledge that I actually went and shopped in the store. Yep. So it's just, it just keeps adding cyclically to, to people collecting and collecting and collecting. You know, perhaps uh, you'll forgive me if I, if I make this statement, but uh, the gravity of the situation is quite severe. I don't think folks realize that. And often in my own head, I, I sort of parallel the situation we're in today akin with World War II when the Axis powers had this caricature of what particular communities were like and what their tendencies were and what their patterns were. I, I often look, when I look at data, and I, and I work a lot with different databases and data sets, as you know quite well, back of your head, that eugenics moment kind of hits in where we've now sort of thought through how this data can help us create the ideal society and control the narrative and control the flow of things. I know this question has come up repeatedly and it's come to my attention right now. Once again, I want to big up the CyberX team for making things really simple for me as a host because I get everything poured into me on one screen, which is phenomenal. And that is this question about, can you talk to us a little bit about how instruments like Facebook or social media in general have been used to influence political patterns as well without us knowing? And I know everybody's referring to the Trump election. Your perspective on that. Um, yeah, so essentially, they know what people are clicking on. They know, they know what you select, they know what you look at. Uh, so they know the types of person that is going to fall for an article um, about environment, right? So they'll take, a, they'll take an article that puts the party that they want to look positive in the environment, or when, let's say, you were trying to kick a president or a prime minister out, they would take the one article out of 100 that makes them look negative in the world of environment, and they would put that article in the front of the person who cared about environment. 
a person with a social social issue in Canada. We have a lot of issues around the indigenous cultures and trying to protect them. Right. So they find the issue, which they know that is your pinpoint. That's the one that you care about. And then they find the one that puts your candidate in the negative light and puts the other candidate in a positive light and starts to sway your opinion the other way. Which is why we shouldn't use Facebook for research ever. But unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are doing it. And I think it's quite interesting that you mentioned that point about using Facebook for research. Often when I receive papers, for example, to comment on uh, or essays that I have to mark, you know, it doesn't go... uh, uh, a moment doesn't pass by where I haven't seen somebody cite a Facebook source uh, and tell me that, oh, well, I, I got this from Facebook and it, it, must, be, it must be true since uh, it's on the internet. And, and it's very, very interesting to see how passively we've come to accept the truths that we see uh, online. And I want to build upon that just a little bit more. Now, if we go back to, and we're slowly but surely creeping towards these compliance standards that exist, You mentioned that the onus of responsibility begins with the technology companies themselves. And if here in Canada, but there I'd argue around the world, privacy by design is one of those those Bibles that we've been referring to when it comes to holding technology companies accountable. I want to start off with one of the fundamental principles of privacy by design, which is the idea of privacy being proactive and not reactive. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? So uh, privacy, the way privacy by design works, in case anyone isn't familiar, it was yeah. designed by Dr. Ann Kavukian, who is a big supporter of CyberX as well. Um, Dr. Ann Kavukian used to be the privacy commissioner of Ontario. And uh, essentially, again, as we're back to companies, were not putting privacy in the forefront. Uh, and so there are seven principles, like you said. And the proactive, not reactive, is the fact that you need to put privacy into the design, right. not after the fact. Um, a lot of the the principles, and I don't know how much we're going to get into them, but a lot of the principles, you know, like having privacy on by default and not off by default, um, having a zero sum trade off, all of these things are coming back to the fact that the product has to have privacy embedded into the product. So if you sell a door, that door comes with a lock. It's not a door without a lock that the user or the homeowner then has to go purchase a lock. Uh, we are pr- proactively considering the privacy concerns um, b- while designing the product and not coming in after. Uh, but one thing to understand about the privacy by design, it's guidelines. Uh, and I've actually had a lot of chats with clients. They're like, how can we just automate this thing? Right. You can never automate design because it is very, very specific to the product you're creating. And uh, the first step in all of it is to define what your product is actually supposed to be doing. And I think that's a lot of problem. Like I, there was another wonderful author that had very well put, um, are you a product that's trying to connect people like Facebook or are you a product that's trying to collect information from people and make a better marketing experience? And if you're honest at the forefront about what you're actually trying to do, then you can proactively put privacy in as the first and foremost thing that you do. You know, often you find a lot of folks who start to hear about, uh, data breaches and what's happened, for example, Facebook uh, having a data breach or LinkedIn having a data breach, um, you know, they often then sort of go into this mode where they think to live well is to live concealed and they, they simply try to uh, tune off completely. But that's not quite, especially now in the new normal, that's not quite easy to do because you do need a lot of these tools to operate. You raised something there, which I think is about the third principle in privacy by design, and you could keep me true to this, is this idea of zero sum versus positive sum. Can you explain on that just a little bit more? So the zero sum is that there shouldn't be a trade-off between privacy and security. It shouldn't be one or the other. Um, What we find in the cybersecurity world is it's always a trade-off between convenience and security. Right. Right. That that it's um, so ultimately it's that you can design a product that protects the access to the information and then also maintains privacy within that information, um, you shouldn't have to trade anything off. You shouldn't have to trade off um, any part of your design in order to protect privacy. There are ways to do it. The problem with all of this is it always takes more time and is more expensive. It is much easier to sell the door without the lock in it than it is to actually put the lock in the door. 
Let's build on that just a little bit. And you know, in, in our engagements over the, I mean, we met at the CISO forum held by CyberX and EC Council uh, uh, approximately one year ago in Niagara Falls. And our and our partnership and our relationship has grown from there. One thing that I've always noticed about you is a very structured approach but a really tailored approach when you talk about privacy. When you talk to me, uh, certain assumptions, and I don't mean that in a negative way, are made about what I know about technology. But when you talk to somebody who's actually sitting there and coding, you talk in a bit of a different way, and you use little different methods in order to get the point across. How easy has it been to talk to a coder, for that matter, who typically, if I follow the assumptions or the stereotypes, typically works behind closed doors. How easy is it for someone like yourself to go in there and say, hold on a second, as opposed to making privacy this add-on that we're going to put once everything is made, we need to embed privacy into everything that you're doing. What is that conversation like, and what are the challenges there? So the, the bigger the company, the bigger the challenge. Uh, with a smaller company, typically the developers are responsible for their own requirements. And so really what it comes down to is who it, who's creating the requirements. Right. I know um, from having worked at RIM BlackBerry, uh, the, when I started, it was small. I actually wrote my own requirements. And I yeah. got to make up my own features. And having been there a decade, then people were coming and saying, because um, I was then on the architecture team, and people were coming and saying, this is what it has to look like at the end. And then we had to build a requirement set around that. So going to a small company, to a developer, and saying, look, you're making the choices here. Um, you want to avoid collecting highly sensitive data, right? So going to a set of developers, which I've done and said, hey, you know what? Biometrics are highly sensitive. Right. So let's find a way to design this without biometrics. Let's consider every new piece of data that you're putting in here and say, is this high sensitive? Is it not? And can we find a better choice here? That's an easy conversation to have because again, they're making the choices. What happens now is you've got bigger companies and the requirements are coming from product managers who have these beautiful big sky visions where they're like, you know, it'd be awesome if you can unlock this with your face. Right. <laughs> and then by the time it gets down to the developer, the developer's like, well, I don't know what choice I have. So I'm just going to try and secure this in the best possible way that I can. Cause suddenly we've added highly sensitive information to this product we don't need. Right. Um, so, so really what I like to try and explain to people is that there's a role for everyone here in privacy. It, it comes from the top. It has to be a priority. Again, we, just talked about how it takes time and money to put privacy into the foundation. It is more expensive to, to program in privacy than it is not to. So it has to come from the CFO who's in charge of the money. It has to come from whoever's creating your requirements that they understand what is necessary and what isn't. And then it has to go down into the development team to say, you guys are the front line of actually creating this stuff. Let's make sure we are limiting the information and securing the stuff that's there. So quite a few questions are starting to uh, to find its way to my desk here, uh, and I'll I'll pick up uh, I'll pick through whichever ones I can. I do want to let our audience know that if I do miss out on a question, you can go on to www.cyberexchange.ca, post on the wall, and and one of us will will try and answer that question post the event as well, or post the power hour. Uh, so I'll take as many as I can because we do have a bit of a narrative to follow here as well. So Kat, um, I'll rephrase it as I always do, is not all breaches are created equal or not all breaches are supposed to be treated equal. That's the assumption that this question makes. When a breach does happen, for example, Facebook gets breached. And you know, without just picking on Facebook, uh, the running room recently had a bit of a breach. Is there occasion to say that some breaches we can sort of say, ah, you know what, slap on the wrist and we're good to go, uh, and some breaches need immediate attention? Or in your perspective, are all breaches going to go through the same court of assessment? No, I, every breach to me is different. Uh, Garmin went down. That was such yeah. a great example to me because people often talk about breaches in terms of leaked information and accessible information. But um, the inaccessibility of information is a breach. So uh, for those hikers that were in the middle of nowhere and needed their GPS to work in order yeah. to get out of a forest, that was a massive breach. That was a risk of harm. So in the, in the compliance world, we rate all breaches on um, real risk of significant harm, or ROSH sometimes they call it. And so the question is, what is the real risk of significant harm? Um, again, back to that fact that I said you can't automate stuff. It really also depends on your audience. So religion here in Canada isn't a big deal, but religion in some other countries, if that got leaked, could be a real risk of harm. Yeah. Um, uh, same thing with sexual orientation. So there's information that is culturally treated differently. Yep. And so I always recommend for companies to review the information they have 
ahead of time because we know that it's when you're breached and not if you're breached <laughs> and and look at it in terms of what would be the real risk of significant harm if this were leaked if this were inaccessible or the third one is if it's wrong um if you're going into surgery and your file got switched to say that it was your left knee that needed surgery instead of your right knee that's a fundamental problem so <laughs> what is the real risk of harm in each of these pieces of information being inaccessible, incorrect, or, or leaked. And then evaluating that ahead of time, it will take you time, but that time ahead of time saves you from the panic uh, during a breach to actually be able to say, is this something we need users to know about immediately? Um, is this something we need to handle immediately? Or is this something we can kind of let go and, and not worry about so much? You know, we now find ourselves sort of in the wrestling ring with ethicists and moral philosophers because really there is uh, the risk, uh, the risk harm sort of uh, valuation that we need to do really brings us down to the ethics within our society. And it brings me to another question, which I'll, I'll sort of correlate to an experience or, or another power hour rather that I conducted uh, last week or, or the first week of our exchanges. And that was with Mark Dillon. Mark Dillon, uh, as you know, is the vice president of IT at Waterloo North Hydro, a good friend, another mentor of mine, and someone who's on our cyber exchange advisory. And he sort of flagged, well, we were talking about critical assets and crown jewels of infrastructure of nation states. He brought up the idea just a little bit about breaches. And he spoke about, just think about how certain breaches affect us psychologically. And he brought up the example of Ashley Madison adult friend finder for that matter, which all had moments when they were breached quite significantly. But there was a huge portion of the society that said, good, we need to rid this evil. This was a good thing that they were breached. What's your optic into these kind of movements that say, sometimes some programs need to be breached? I don't think anyone needs to be breached. Um, I, I'm not a fan of adultery. I am not endorsing this. <laughs> but again, that's, I always find that I, I say like everything on the internet should be considered public yep. because it will inevitably become public um, and permanent. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm kind of of the, if you, if you use that product, you're using it with that caveat. And if someone didn't realize that that could be made public and that was something that they were doing, then that is on them. Yep. So I don't feel badly for groups like that because they've chosen, um, there was, there was a really big porn scam in the UK for a while where there was a free porn app. Yeah. And then if you downloaded it, it was recording you. And then, and then you were getting ransomware from, with your own recording. I'm like, to me, that was buyer beware. Like, <laughs> yeah. was, um, you made that choice to download it. So yeah. I am a very big on accountability in that sense that if you're using something online, if you have to go into it with that knowledge, it could become public. I don't think anyone in the world deserves to have their information shared like that. Yep. Uh, I, and again, you're like, you just said, it's ethical. I mean, there's, there's polyamorous societies where that's not a problem. And then there are other societies where people frown upon it. Yep. And so I'm, I'm not going to make moral judgment on anyone. Um, but like, if we come back to like, we, we were just talking about, well, like sexual orientation, certainly in, there are some countries where we don't care. And there are other countries where there are legal Absolutely. issues yep. around that. So, um, yeah, so that's a problem. Like if you had a grinder app running in a, in a country where homosexuality was illegal, you are going to have a problem if that gets leaked. Yep. Um, so from, from sitting here, I'm like, that should never happen. Like, but again, there's someone there that's going, it's illegal. And if it happens, it happens. I, it's, it's a really hard one. I don't think anyone ever, ever deserves to have a list released. That's unfair. You know, I think hearing you, it's, it sort of resonates with the idea, and I think Edward Snowden talks about this quite a bit, is this notion of privacy is not about that I have something to hide, it's that I have something to protect. Uh, and, and there's a fundamental difference between the two there that needs to be understood, which I want to parallel with uh, the point that you brought up about the cultural aspect of privacy, the nation-state aspect of privacy. You know, in our own work together um, with, your, with your friends at uh, Armor Cyber, we've been working on a project together on developing an not, not necessarily an automated system, but a checklist using some form of data parsing that can at least get you to a certain score and then take you down a particular path. I'd imagine that the reports that we've produced sort of show you the path, and then you still need the guidance to walk through that step by step. Now, Let's talk about this for a second. There were many uh, privacy regulations that you had in there, some from California, some from Brazil, some from the EU. Let's bring it to Canada. What are the, some of the compliance standards that uh, take effect in Canada that we need to be aware of? So we are under PIPIDA. PIPIDA is quite dated. Uh, it's, 
it was, it was, is it an electronics document act? It's the personal information protection, electronic documents act. So at least it's electronic based. Um, but, uh, unlike the health ones, which originally started non-electronic, but Pippita doesn't have a lot of legal legs. It's like, I always joke, it's the Canadian compliance because when you break something in there, you kind of get someone knocking on your door in a very Canadian way going, excuse me, um, you sort of broke something. You might want to fix it. <laughs> uh, like we just had a big problem here in Canada with Tim Hortons. And I'm very interested to see how they get taken to task because yeah. again, we don't have a lot of legal legs to stand on, which is where some of these new ones like GDPR and EU, they are fining people immediately. In Quebec, there is a Bill 64. Quebec has a totally different legislation. And um, they, they do, they are able to enact illegal legislation against people that we can't. But this new proposed Bill 64 for Quebec actually has this right to deletion that GDPR includes. We don't have that in PEPIDA. So under PEPIDA, you are actually allowed, which is how this Tim Hortons thing came to light. People don't know. You're actually allowed to go to any Canadian company and request a full copy of your data. Right. Um, you are also allowed to request to rectify any of that data. Correct. Where it stops is you're not allowed to ask to be removed from their system. And that's kind of the extra piece, again, that GDPR says that, that you can have that removal. The other thing that people may not realize is that every prov province has their own health legislation. <laughs> So we talk about HIPAA all the time. HIPAA is actually American. It's the yep. American health legislation. Uh, but every province here has their own. Uh, so if you are working at a company that is especially now going online, if you're taking, let's say you're even like occupational therapists, if you're taking your product or your service into the tech world, you now have to be compliant with a whole list of health regulations that are specific to doing online health. Right. And I think it's very, very crucial that we start to unpack this just a bit more. And there are two other questions that I'll, I'll sort of uh, mix into one. And that is, and, and we'll see, you sort of look at the Brazilian uh, and the EU situations and the EU compliance standards a little later on. But how does compliance or how does privacy sort of take effect in different industries? You know, healthcare very particularly, you know, you brought examples of it. But what about in the world of HR for that matter? What about in the world of finance? How does privacy regulation sort of kick in over there? Are there specific ones or is the idea in Canada that we've got one master regulation and that's supposed to be the altar before which we all bow down? So the, the banks have their own regulations. So we'll keep yeah. that separately, right? Sure. Like, so from a financial perspective, they have their own regulations. Um, but really it's about the, uh, this day and age, I, <laughs> you're quoting all these beautiful philosophers and I'm going to quote Dr. Malcolm from Jurassic Park. And well go back to the, I will go to quoting we, Ali G very shortly. Don't you worry. He will right, come so back. Like, so we'll be good. Just, just because they could, they never thought whether or not they should. Right? right. And, and that is, we are Jurassic parking all over the place. Right. Um, we are collecting a finite amount of data that we require in any industry. And now people are like, you know what? I sell shoes, but I'd really love to know how old you are and where you're coming from so I can right. market better. But ultimately you don't actually need that personal information about me. Um, and there's little things like going back to the privacy by design principles where instead of collecting someone's exact age, you could collect an age range. So you can hide some of that data by obfuscating it, by taking it out to a bigger range. Or instead of saying you live on this street, could we just say what city you live in? So that's a lot of where companies are like, under these regulations, we're telling them to minimize data, but they're guidelines. All of the regulations are guidelines. And they say, you know, here are the rules you need to follow, but how you follow them is still very much independent on, on the company. And it's Correct. really up to you. If I say, have you minimized the data? You could say yes, but have you, right? So you really need to go back and sit there and go, okay, well, again, I'm collecting exact age. Do I need to do that? Do I need to know someone's religion? I don't need that. That's a highly sensitive piece of information. If I eliminate that, I don't have to protect it. That actually makes my life easier. So um, yeah, so the regulations are providing guidelines, which are great, but there's still work to do on the end of the company. You can't just automatically, like you said, we provide an automatic assessment, which is what you and I have been working on to assess where people are in compliance, yep. but actually getting the work done, it's still up to the individual company to make sure they're following that. Great segue into this idea of, you know, we're seeing you know, different countries have got different standards based on whatever uh, their circumstances are. There are different political circumstances, economic circumstances, cultural circumstances, and moral standpoints that different communities take. We have GDPR, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, emanates from the EU. Uh, we have standards coming out of Brazil. 
Um, could you summarize some of those standards, but also point us perhaps to a direction of a particular country or community that you feel has sort of got it close to on point when it comes to understanding privacy? Kat? So, okay, so it's always, it always comes down to innovation over individuals or individuals okay. over innovation. Uh, at this point, the US is kind of a free for all. They've very been much been pro innovation. So do what you can as fast as you can. Uh, there are actually individual legislations in most of the states, but they're, they're small. Uh, CCPA, which came out in California last year or this year, technically at the beginning of the year, is the first one to really impose restrictions on, as we talked about consent, mm -hmm. uh, making sure people were opting in to have their data used. And they also have this right to, to deletion which just to be clear, because that one gets mixed up all the time, the right to deletion is, I don't like that Google result, remove it. That's not what that is. Yep. <laughs> the right to deletion is, hey, Facebook, I want off your service. And that doesn't mean I want my profile removed. That means I actually want you to go back in your servers and take out every record you have of my ever having been on there and stop processing that information. So, so that's the removal part that we're missing. Um, the EU, as you'd mentioned, which is the GDPR, is very much individual over innovation. So that's individual first. Uh, Brazil's LGPD, which was supposed to come out, but it's delayed. It is the same as pretty much GDPR. And uh, PIPIT is in the middle. Uh, we are really very much a little of this and a little of that. So PIPIT is rules are very individual first, but the, again, the enforcement isn't there for the companies to comply with them. Right. What we are seeing come out of uh, new legislation coming out of India, okay. um, with the India privacy law, is a lot more of what we call data sovereignty, which is where we're starting to tell companies that data must be maintained in the country at which it's collected. Okay. So if you are collecting from someone in India, that data now will need to be stored on Indian soil and you can't bring it back to an American company. Where we saw this recently was, as I brought up Max Schrems, Max Schrems had brought this thing against Privacy Shield. Right. So if anyone is unfamiliar with Privacy Shield, it allowed companies to take data from the EU into the US and store it. And it said, you know, it's encrypted, it's being transferred properly, it's fine. But the minute it was stored on US soil, it fell into the US acts and the US acts allow the government to get into that data at any time with very little reason, which was right. Edward Snowden's whole issue. Right. So Schrems has been pushing this for a long time where he said that doesn't make sense with our GDPR. Like as soon as it crosses the border, it's a free for all, right? That doesn't make any sense. So they just, they took that away very recently. And now if you're in the EU, um, you do need to store in the EU. You cannot transfer over to the US anymore. Okay. You know, since you brought up Edward Snowden, um, if, I, if I recall, he had said something while he was the one who sort of said, right, that privacy is not about that I've got something to hide, it's that I have something to protect. And, and it's about the notion or this crazy notion apparently that uh, I want to share with the world whatever I want on my own terms, which necessarily takes me to uh, a question which is coming from within. And that is more this idea of, do we truly have that ability to share on our own terms? Is the public good more important than private interests? What, do you, what is your perspective on this? And I know it's a bit of a, uh, a, an ethical sort of boilerplate that I'm putting you on, but what's your view? Uh, that's a really hard one. And, and it comes down, like, if you look at any of the regulations, there's always fine print that says, you know, you have to protect this data unless, yeah. unless um, right. there's a legal issue behind it, unless there's something else. I mean, even the right to deletion, like the legal, uh, you have to keep data for accountants, like financial data, right? So even that would trump the, I need, I want you to delete me from your system. Well, I can't delete you because for legal reasons, I have to keep the accounting data where I paid you. So like, right. there's always a, what if thing. Um, I think the contact tracing is such a beautiful example of that. Yep. And uh, although the current contact tracing app does have a privacy first, I've now explained this to many people, it, it isn't taking your personal information. Um, it really is doing it in a way that is, is quite good for privacy. But at the same time, it's a greater good thing. Yep. So I, I had to, I had a problem with my laptop and I had to go in the mall and uh, go to Apple to have it fixed. And they took my temperature and it was such a weird invasion of privacy <laughs> to me that I'm standing in the middle of the mall and they're taking my private or my temperature. And I understand from this COVID perspective why they're doing that. 
but I'm in a public mall. And so if I had come up with a fever and they turned me away, I am now disclosing that information to everyone around me that, you've got that, that. I have a fever. I didn't consent to that. I just kind of walked up to them and they, I didn't have a choice. I had to get in the store. They're holding up this thermometer. Like it was all a really weird experience. So I think if it's, if, if there is a greater good element, we always have this. I think there is an element where, where privacy is less important for the greater good of humanity, but trying to find that line is really, really hard, right? So, so disclosing that you were on a flight and had COVID is one thing saying that person who was sitting in like row five seat D had COVID is, is not necessary. So I'm back to that age range thing. Like, do you have to specifically say that person or can you just say someone in the vicinity had it? So how can we do it in a, in a, in a way that's divulging the least amount of personal information? Yeah. Again, weaving in another question is this idea that, great, we've got these compliance standards. We're continuously making the public more and more aware about the conversation and the narratives around privacy. What are the legislations intended to do such that if someone does breach, by someone I mean a, a firm, a technology firm, or whatever have you, has actually uh, breached one of the legislations, what happens then? Is it just, hey, fix this and, and you're good? Or is it just a fine and, and fix it and uh, we'll see you when you have your next breach? What's, what value does all of this compliance regulations bring if the measures that are taken to respond to a breach are not strong enough? So th oh, there's a lot of things at play there. So, so the first thing is all the regulations have notification guidelines, which yeah. is all n very important, right? So it could have been like, oh, look, there was this breach six months ago and we neglected to mention it, which still happens with yeah. big companies in this state. We have 72 hour turnarounds. We have to let um, the privacy commissioner in Canada know if we've been breached. Under EU, you have to let the individual data protection authorities know that you've been breached. So there is now more accountability behind, okay, I've had this problem and I have to let them know. Back to that real risk of harm, if it is a very low risk, if you misplaced a file for an hour and then you found it and you know nobody looked at it or it was one individual's file, um, then that's a low risk, right? You sent out a list of email addresses that, that aren't really private email addresses, yeah. low risk. But if you sent out an Excel spreadsheet that wasn't locked, that had a bunch of credit card numbers on it with matching names, high risk, you need to let those people know as soon as possible so they can mitigate. The way the fines work, is very much on due diligence because we already said it's not it's not uh, if you're breached it's when right? right so the fines are very much based on did you do everything you said you could do in order to protect this information from both a security perspective and a privacy perspective uh, are you storing credit card numbers when you don't need them in which case you're going to get fined for that because you didn't need them are you storing them because you sell things um, and then you tried to do everything you could and you still got breached lower fine Right, so the fines are very much proportional to the due diligence that you've done. I've seen companies where uh, people have gone and said, I want a copy of my information and the company ignores them. And then they ask again and they right. ignore them. They ask five times and then they get a $200,000 fine. There's, that's not a big deal in terms, there's no breach there. But what the data protection authority is trying to make the statement that says, we're serious here. And if, if you're not complying with this regulation, we're going to fine you. Um, so in that sense, like I keep telling people, it's a best effort due diligence. And uh, when Equifax was breached, yep. uh, that was a total mess. But the actual, uh, that was the first time the executives were actually involved in the lawsuit. And the executives were there because they signed off on the cybersecurity plan. They right. signed off to say they had done everything they could do from a cybersecurity perspective. So their heads are now on the block because they signed off on it. And I, I appreciate that. So we are now at least from that perspective saying this, this wasn't because someone left their machine unlocked. This is because you created a system in which machines could be left unlocked and didn't automatically lock after 30 seconds. And therefore you didn't do everything you could to protect this information. You know, everything that you could to protect this information. Let's just build another floor on top of that notion. And that is, is it is privacy, when you mentioned earlier on at the, the onset of the conversation, is that we now put the onus on the technology firms. You know, you point at the technology firms this way, but you have three fingers pointing at yourself. What's the onus, though, on the individuals themselves? Is it that it's just that the technology company's fault? Or do we as users have a responsibility to ensure that we're also playing our part? And I'll give you a little bit of context about where this is coming from. 
And this is this idea of uh, a show that you brought up uh, prior to in the green room, which was this idea of the show of Indian matchmakers. So let's take, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to sort of go into this. In the Indian matchmaker, you see the matchmaker has got what she calls the biodata of everybody. And she can match you with the right person based on a couple of traits. This isn't an organization. This is one individual who knows something about you albeit a little bit formally. But you and I, for example, we know something about each other uh, or we have engaged in a particular workplace. How do we as individuals also bear onus on how we conduct ourselves ethically in a privacy framework? Yeah, so this one is nearly impossible to monitor. And this is our problem. We are now in a world where you could take my picture and I could not know about it and you could share it. Yep. Right. So if and and even worse than that, again, if you read the terms and conditions, if I were to take your picture and share it on Instagram, unless there's something illegal in that picture, there's no reason for Instagram to take that down. So if you go back to them and say, hey, I didn't authorize the posting of this photo, that's not a reason for them to take it down in the terms and conditions. So we are we are at the mercy of every other human being who has met us, known us, knows anything about us not to share that information. And that is a really big problem. Like if you're in a grocery store um, and someone sees you from across the grocery store and it's the receptionist at some medical office and they're yelling across and they're like, oh, hey, you're from that prostate exam earlier. Right. Like there's nothing you can do <laughs> to stop that. So we are totally, totally at the mercy of other human beings. Um, that is just education. And, and unfortunately, like I don't post pictures of other people's children because I'm sensitive to this issue, but I have had many a time to go untag myself from photos that I'm in or that my kids are in or ask other people to take them down. But even at that, I can't make them do it. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's this concept about, you know, we're not quite able to control the way in which our information is received. In a couple, I've, I've followed you quite a bit on, on social media through Binary Tattoo, and you talk a lot about this idea of even how we take our pictures, not just what we take pictures of, but how we take pictures. Can you walk us through the next few minutes? We've got about eight minutes. For the next couple of minutes, can you talk to us a little bit about some good cyber hygiene practices? For example, you've often made the statement, and then I, I, I side by it 100%, is don't just take a picture of the Zoom meeting without asking everyone. Right? Or don't just take a picture of yourself taking a picture with a meeting happening behind you because it has certain repercussions. Walk us through certain cyber hygiene practices specifically within this new normal. So yeah, for sure. There's, there's professional and then there's personal. So from a professional perspective, there is no way you would ever have walked into a meeting room and just taken a photo of everyone in that meeting room and then turned around and posted it on LinkedIn. Like it wouldn't have happened. But what's worse about the Zoom is that not only are people taking the screenshots, but generally the names are across all of the photos. So right at the beginning of this whole pandemic, somebody was like all excited that they got their meeting online and they were like, hey, 30 of us were online today. And there I am, I'm like, there are 30 names and likenesses. So I now have the visuals on 30 people um, for me to be able to look at that and say, I know 30 names of this people who work at this company. I know what they look like. I could social engineer any of them. The other thing I could do is screen cap their picture and then, especially when you've got the still photo, yep. and then I could sign in for a meeting later and just use that as my own photo and be that person. And no one would think twice about me sitting in on this confidential meeting because yep. I've got the name and photo of someone who works there. Yep. So from a company security perspective, we have to transfer the what we would have done in office to what we're doing at home. And you would never do that, right? You would never tag everyone with a name and then share right. it, share it publicly. Uh, so that, yeah, the Zoom thing is kind of getting me. But on top of that, it's it's the private background. And you've got a beautiful blank background behind you. <laughs> um, I'm sitting in my office, which I, I know exactly what's behind me right now. But uh, certainly, especially with people doing online classes, uh, I really feel for university students who share apartments and like, you know, they're stuck in their own bedroom because what else do they have? Yep. But trying to find that corner of the room where your background isn't all of your private information with the Fair. name of the high school you graduated with and an award of something. Um, social engineering is huge and I think people discount that. And so uh, ensuring that um, we're not sharing any of that private information in the backgrounds, especially other human beings is really, really key right now. Yeah. 
you know, when you talked about the idea of social engineering, I just want to take a couple of seconds to, to just let the, the audience know that when you are attending the cyber exchange, I believe, and Maddie can probably keep me true to this, uh, I believe on the, four, on the fifth day on Smart Communities, we have a group from Trinidad uh, and cybersecurity folks from Trinidad and Tobago that are going to be talking about uh, issues around cybersecurity and privacy in their communities, but also particularly about SIM jacking that is happening in Jamaica, which is rooted in the principles of social engineering. Uh, and secondly, we also have Dr. Ann Kavukian who's going to be talking on day one about the contact tracing app and, uh, and privacy around that. So make sure you mark your calendars for that. Kat, we've got another five minutes, and I want to jump into this whole aspect of your persona and how you've been this champion and advocate around privacy rights to the point where you've found every occasion that you've had the chance to speak up about it, you have. And one thing that I've learned uh, from the way you engage is that, you know, you find a lot of people say, I don't care about privacy because I have nothing to hide. And you've often turned around to them and said, that's akin to saying, I don't care about free speech because I have nothing to say. You sort of position privacy as a matter for all of us to be involved in and all of us to play our part in. Can you recommend maybe a book or a movie that uh, our audience should watch to sort of get their heads into why this is such an important issue, but more importantly around what can we all do to ensure that we're playing our part in uh, making our privacy frameworks more efficient? Yeah, well, definitely awareness. I get that's the number one thing is just being aware that every time you're online, again, everything that you have, and I have numerous examples of my own private information being suddenly posted on a social network due to a software bug. Yeah. So, you know, um, everything you do online should be considered, again, public and permanent. And so with that thought, do I want to put out this? Do I want to add to my tattoo? Because like a real tattoo, you can remove things online, but it is painful and it is expensive. And once it's out there, it's out there. Uh, from a movie perspective, um, I think The Great Hack, which was on Netflix, yep. is a really easy consumable one because it is, it's, it's down at a level that everyone can understand. If you're just a Facebook user, if you're highly technical or not technical, it breaks down the whole Cambridge Analytica thing. And I think it's a really great example of a mass collection um, of information that's being taken. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard now uh, to pinpoint it. The, the one other example I always give people is, uh, I get a lot of parents will be like, my teenage girl keeps posting bikini photos on Instagram <laughs> because people don't appreciate the audience it's going to. They in their heads want the four people they want to see that photo to see it and not anyone else. And so I have given this advice to more parents than I'd like to admit, but I will say, do you have like a male middle-aged friend and invite them over and then have them say to your daughter, oh, hey, nice blue bikini in that photo yesterday. <laughs> because nothing will get someone to make a private account faster than the knowledge of, of who can see their stuff. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, like you've said many times today, uh, people don't think they have anything to hide until it comes back at their faces, right? Until I'm like, oh, hey, you're this age, you went to this school, you've got this many kids, these are their names, and this is where you work, and this is where you live, and this is where you go to the gym, and here are the last three internet searches you did. I mean, that creeps people out when it comes back in their faces. And until that happens in some way, shape, or form, people don't see it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, hard, it's a hard lesson to learn when that's the way it comes. But, but knowing who could see your information and creating, setting those privacy settings, please, please set your privacy settings, uh, because again, we're giving out private information all over the place with anniversary dates and all sorts of things we use for passwords inside public posts that we should not be sharing. It's almost like in this day and age, invisibility is a superpower uh, that uh, you know we all need to sort of find portions of in some shape or fashion. In closing, looking at the pandemic, where do you see our privacy regulations headed to? Do you see any new concepts coming to the fore? At the Cyber Exchange, for example, you and Farooq Nair will be talking about the changes to PHIPAA. Where else do you see changes coming in our frameworks? 30 seconds. I, I think, again, from a Canadian perspective, especially, we want to see people being able to enact legal action. Yeah. So if, if corporations know someone can sue them or that they could at least go to the government and the government could enact a fine, that will make a big difference in, in having companies put the money and the time and the effort forward into becoming compliant first. Kat, thank you for your time today. If I'm gonna take the next 30 seconds to just summarize what I've understood 
in this wonderful exchange. As always, engaging with you has been uh, a process of learning for myself and self-discovery, so I thank you for that. And to our audience, as, uh, as Kat sort of alluded to, um, I, I like to sort of relate what we're hearing uh, to other aspects of literature or other academic practices that uh, you and I may be a part of. Uh, many of you would have heard of the name uh, Khalil Gibran, a very well-known uh, poet from the Middle East. And he, he says something about secrets and private lives. And he says, um, if you tell your secrets or your private disclosures to the wind, don't be surprised if the trees find out about it. Case in point is that there are no secrets on the internet. There's nothing that you can necessarily hide without leaving a breadcrumb of sorts. And that breadcrumb picked up one after the other can tell a story and a whole loaf of a story about you that you really do not want the world to be consuming. So be careful, be cautious, be open to new ideas, but always look at what you are providing and at what cost. I really like that notion of what is the value exchange when you're using a particular platform. You know, when we spoke earlier on and we spoke about this idea of privacy is not about having something to hide, but something to protect, we went back to this notion of protect from whom and protect from what. And information given in the wrong hands can result in some of the eugenics-like practices that I, that I inferred to earlier on. Tomorrow, I'll be joined by Sherry Rumbold at the Power Hour, another woman champion in cybersecurity, and another leader who has a lot to give us and a lot to get us to think about when it comes to our cybersecurity posture, not just as individuals, but as a nation state. I want to thank the team again from CyberX and remind everybody that in less than two business days, we'll be live from this beautiful studio here in the town of Ajax uh, with five days of content on healthcare, smart communities, business continuity, women in cybersecurity, and CISO-related discussions. All you need to do to be a part of it is go on to www.cyberexchange.ca, create a profile, and you will get alerts from the team. I want to thank Madhi Raza again for all of his vision in making this happen. You know, stretching out of the normal is considered a way in which we can see the art of the possible, and in this new normal, he has shown us a plethora of possibilities. I thank you all for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you tomorrow at 12 p.m. EST for the next Power Hour. Thank you, Kat. Appreciate your time, and I'll see you thank in the green you. room.